This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Class, please. If you don't learn Roman numerals, you'll never know the date certain motion pictures were copyrighted. <sighs> Safe at last. Caution. Exit through door seven only. All other rooms contain... Man, even tigers! Oh, the numerals. They never even tried to teach us that in school. Okay, think, Bart. Where have you seen Roman numerals before? I know. Rocky V. That was the fifth one. So, Rocky five plus Rocky two equals Rocky seven. Adrian's revenge! Hey everybody, this is Bad Fans. Yes, we're still here. Uh, this is episode number 180. Um, my name is Dane, and I'm here with Tim. So, Tim, how are you doing? Here I am. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, I'm getting over being sick for the last week, and I had a nice streak going. I was last time I was sick was when the Force Awakens came out back in December 2015. So <laughs> wow, I've had a nice good about. Three years of not being sick, but I finally got hit last week, so that wasn't fun. Yeah. But doing better now. Just got a little nagging cough, so kind of feel like General Grievous for the last few days. But <laughs> I'll try not to cough sick. too much on the show. I don't think you're that sick, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, you you got a cold. You got sick um, at the beginning of the franchise. I mean, at the beginning of the new trilogy, and you're, you're getting sick at the end of the new trilogy. <laughs> hey, that's a great way to look at it, actually. Yeah. I just uh, hope I'm not sick when the movie comes out, because I, I wasn't sick when The Force Awakens came out. I got sick that uh, week after the its opening weekend. So if that's the same case this time, yeah. that's fine. I just want to be nice and well when I'm actually in the theater seeing it for the first time. I know. Can you imagine if you're like really sick to the point where you can't go to the theater? I'll I'll have to be dead for me not to go to the beer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, but yeah. Uh, so early, earlier this week, I, I want to say like Wednesday, uh, Monday. Um, you know, uh, Mark, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. He uh, blew my mind. How did right? he blow your mind? Okay, so well, my first question is: It's soccer related? <laughs> no, no, it has nothing to do with sports. It has nothing to do with it's it's uh, totally random. Uh, so so I uh, filled up gas on Monday, right? Yeah. Uh, my tank was uh, I'd say quarter tank, right? Okay. So I filled it up, um, and it was about. Or let me ask you, how, how much do you think it cost me? Hmm. See, I'm guessing or I'm hoping the story is that you paid less than what you used to. So let's say $25. Wow. I wish. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not that good. Though. So <laughs> it was about $75. Oh, man. Wow. So yeah. yeah, total opposite direction of the story I thought you were going with. <laughs> yeah, so about three times as much. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, gas is uh, three sixty five for regular. Um, but I like that's, to. Uh, that's actually been pretty good over here. Like for the longest yeah. time, it's been like around four bucks. So yeah, well, if you go to the Outer Islands, mm -hmm. it's usually a dollar more. So like four sixty five for regular. Wow. Right. So, um, yeah, so it was about $80. I, I, I drive a Toyota Camry, uh, and Mark drives a Honda CRV, right? Mm -hmm. So both Japanese cars, both 
Asian cars, right? Uh, both have great gas mileage, even though his is a, a SUV. Uh, do you know how much he pays to go from like, I don't know, empty to full? I'm hoping it's cheaper than yours. So I'll say, I say I'm gonna, I'm going on the more positive direction for these questions. I'll say fifty dollars. About twenty eight dollars. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Man, how's how's that possible? <laughs> exactly. Like, like how does how, how does that happen? I I I, I don't get it. Like, yeah. like uh, w- w- what's the difference? I know. <laughs> why is there such a big difference? He's gonna have to elaborate on why <laughs> I know. it's so cheap for him because that is amazing. Yeah. So. That that blew my mind earlier this week. Uh, I know, after I lost seventy dollars, yeah. <laughs> I thought the days of filling up a car for twenty five bucks or in the twenties is long gone. But yeah. <laughs> that's why I was hoping it was the case for you. But at least for someone, it was. So <laughs> good, good for Mark. Yeah, so that's why I'm going to ask you. Well, you, you drive a truck, right? Yeah. You saw yeah so, so, so how much does it? Uh, cost for you to fill it up i'd say let me guess about like 60 no not that much thankfully i really? could probably yeah um if it's see i never usually have to i don't wait till it gets like full-blown empty to yeah. fill it up so when i do it's usually around like probably 50 bucks but if it was maybe on empty with nothing you know that lights on <laughs> yeah maybe it'll be close to 60 but really 50 yeah for a truck yeah a Nissan Frontier. Yep. Wow. I. You see, that just makes me really, really depressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I drive a full size sedan, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, it it costs me more to fill up. Than it does for your truck. Most, I know for both me and Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's time for you to go electric, Dane. I don't know. I guess I, I like fully electric, not hybrid, fully electric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, maybe they should make a car that runs on solar power. Yeah, because uh, and, the sun is certainly out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you can't drive at night. But <laughs> yeah. Well, technically you can, but you just can't go far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get all your driving and errands done in the daytime. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, let's move on to our Darknet Rises Minute by Minute commentary. Uh, so for this episode, we're going from minute 128, or the 2 hour and 8 minute mark, to uh, 129, or the uh, 2 hour and 9 minute mark. Uh, I wonder how much so, it yeah. takes or costs for Batman to fill up the tumbler. In the no, Dark man, that's, that's like diesel, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, over here, at least, that's like $5 a gallon. So... <laughs> Well, they, thankfully, Bruce can afford it then. <laughs> well, yeah, he's a billionaire, but but still, he should try to save where he can. Can you imagine? It'd be like it'd be like three hundred dollars to fill that thing up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll cost you a new Xbox. Yeah. <laughs> <fill it up. laughs> Every time you fill up the tumbler, it's a new video game console Batman can get. But. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, grab your HD DVD, grab your DVD, grab your uh, Blu-ray, grab your uh, laser disc, grab your beta tape, grab your projector, grab your. Did I say HD HD yeah, DVD? Did. Okay, I think you just missed VHS. A uh, VHS, of course. How can I forget that? Uh, and grab your Blockbuster physical subscription. I mean, uh, your your Blockbuster card, grab your Netflix physical descrip- uh, subscription uh, card, I guess. <laughs> um, your, your red envelope <laughs> with yeah. the disc. <laughs> and grab your Gamefly uh, DVD rental subscription. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget our favorite, Tim. The most important. The way the all movies should be important. viewed. Yeah, especially... Like, I mean, we got episode nine coming up. Make sure. I think I'm going to wait 
to see episode nine until it comes out on the <laughs> VHS the DVD converter. <laughs> no, what you do is you buy out a theater, right? Uh, when it comes on, you know, uh, video on demand or whatever, or uh, yeah, it, uh, video on demand, you you translate that or you um, transfer that to VHS and then you convert it to DVD quality <laughs> and then you project it up on the screen. <laughs> That's the way it's meant to be seen. That's yes. the way. Uh, but well, no, of course. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. But no, of course, grab your H, I mean, your VHS to DVD converted copy. Um, and I'm going to give the contest. So, Tim, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, because I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I am. Uh, three, two, one, hit play. As we're finally getting into some action here, which we have a good portion of. And which, I guess you can technically qualify this as the only Batman and Robin action scene we get in the Dark Knight trilogy. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, also, is this the last scene of Batman at night? I think you're right. Yeah, it is. And this is the part where I got an inkling where, you know... It, there's going to be something more with John Blake by the time we get to the end of this movie where Batman tells him, you know, if you're going to fight, you should wear a mask and all that. It's like, they're setting something up here. <laughs> cool entry by the bat. Now, how much does it cost to fill up the bat, you think? Wow. <laughs> Was it the same as the Tumblr? Yeah. Uh, it, it's got to be at least three times as much yeah. as the, uh, <laughs> As a Tumblr, so about a thousand, nine hundred yeah. to a thousand. <laughs> there you go. Well, at least the police can get out of the sewers. Yeah, we huh? we hit another milestone on this minute. The police are free. <laughs> are finally out of the sewers. <laughs> but that's our Dark Knight Rises minute by minute commentary. Um, and now we can move on to our feature topic, which um, is a pretty big one, Tim. Yeah, I would say so. Or maybe not as big as it could have been. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so it's going to be, which I'm going to call our new annual feature topic at <laughs> this time of year, our E3 recap. I know we did one last year and might as well continue that because we're huge video game fans. You hear us talk about all the big games that we play over the course of a year. So why not? And for this E3, the reason I said it's you know maybe not as big as it could have been, it was a little different. Because there, it just didn't feel as, you know, not as big or like as much fanfare that usually surrounds E3 like past years. And I think there's some pretty good reasons why. I think the biggest one is that Sony wasn't there this year, which was a, kind of shocking when they made that announcement how they're not going to be at E3. And they're going to, I think, start doing their own events. But, you know, I think their presence, uh, or I should say their lack of presence was felt at this E3. Um, just not having that one less presentation and press conference to look forward to and get excited about. So it did feel like there was a little missing from that. But um, we still got some plenty of other stuff to talk about. So we're going to go over some of our you know, favorite games that were announced, shown, and what we're looking forward to in like, the coming years. Because I should say years because most of these games aren't coming out to 2020. <laughs> so it's going to be a wait for a few of them. But um, I will start, I think for me anyway, one that is coming out this year and probably the first big one at E3 that kicked it off on uh, last Saturday at EA Play, which is the new Star Wars game coming out this year, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. And we got our first glimpse at the gameplay aspect of it because we got the announcement and launch or not launch trailer, but (laughs) the reveal trailer at Celebration a few months ago. And now we got our first look at the gameplay mechanics, the graphics environments and all that stuff. So, um, Right off the bat, I got to say, I'm getting more excited for this game. It wasn't anything revolutionary or something we've never seen before, not even in a Star Wars game, because you can make the comparisons to the Force Unleashed. But I'm liking what I've seen as far as lights, the lightsaber combat goes. The graphics on it look really great. The environments on Kashyyyk, because that's where this uh, gameplay demo took place on, was Kashyyyk. It looked great. And the combat looks a lot of fun. It looks really smooth and tight. And... So some of the combos you can pull off with the lightsaber, I was kind of expecting, you know, let's see how much they're pulling from the Force Unleashed. Thankfully, it's not so overpowered like Starkiller was in the Force Unleashed. 
because the main character in this game, Cal, he's, you know, wasn't fully trained as a Jedi. He was only a Padawan, so he's not going to be, you know, super, you know, <laughs> I don't think any Jedi should be as powerful as Starkiller was in some instances, but they're definitely toning it back, which is good to see. But, like, combat looks really smooth. He does have some awesome moves. There was one where he has the Kylo Ren, you know, paralyzed moves on certain uh, enemies he can do but then the one that really stood out for me I know a lot of other fans or people who are watching it was one where you can you know s- slow down time using the force and a stormtrooper fires a blaster and it's moving at you very slow pace but then you can pull a stormtrooper with the force and just like move his body towards the blaster <laughs> so he gets hit by it where you don't have to actually hit him with a lightsaber but so different combos and moves like that look really fun to pull off and then also, too, another cool surprise is, you know, some of the bigger connections it's going to have to the bigger Star Wars universe where it was revealed that Saw Gerrera is going to play a role in the game and in that level on Kashyyyk in particular, being voiced by Vor- Forrest Whitaker again, too, which is awesome. I just love how Forrest Whitaker is just so into the role of Saw Gerrera. He voices him on Rebels now in this video game. So it's just awesome to see. So that was cool. And then there, I had the gameplay demo of it. On Saturday, like I said, which was cool, we saw him take fight a bunch of different troopers. I love the trooper designs in this game. You know, you got your typical stormtroopers, of course, scout troopers, but then the purge troopers look awesome. They actually made their debut in the Charles Soule Darth Vader comics a while ago, and they have these cool helmet designs. And this it's like a cross between death troopers and clone troopers, <laughs> which if anyone knows me is right up my alley. So seeing them in the game and seeing their combat and how that's going to work with Cal fighting them look really cool in that demo. So that was awesome. And then the following day at Microsoft's press conference, they showed a new trailer and that showed more of the that Kashyyyk level that looks really awesome. And I can't wait to see more where Cal and his droid um, is going to take over an AT-AT walker. It just looks really cool. Their walkers are moving through the swamps of Kashyyyk. They got these like leaves and plants all like on them. And then your show Cal like, climbing and progressing to the top of the ATAT it reminded me of the boss battles from Shadow of the Colossus like this huge big objects that you got to traverse and climb to get to and then you go inside and take it over and then you're just mowing down enemies from inside the cockpit and it just looked really really cool so yeah there's a lot about Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order that I'm excited about that kicked off this E3 with a nice bang I felt so that's the first one on my list as far as games that I was most excited about looking forward to yeah, um, you can really tell, and um, I've seen a lot of people, t- you know, talking about this comparison, but um, you can really tell it was influenced by Uncharted. Yeah. Right? And this is Un- Uncharted colon Star Wars, right? <laughs> um, I am hesitant on it. Really? Yeah. Um, Why is that? Well, it can be summed up in one word, Tim. Anthem. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, this isn't a Bioware game, though. <laughs> but it's under the EA, you know, uh, thing, right? Yeah, it is um, still EA, but I got more so, confidence in this team than with Respawn. <laughs> so is is this going to be, you know, speaking of Uncharted, uh, more like a Naughty Dog thing where it's a single-player narrative game or is this going to be a short campaign w- with a online aspect that's the main focus well that's the thing so far the developers of Resmart are really emphasizing this is a single player driven game there's not even mention or talk about multiplayer so yeah i don't know i don't i'm not i i'm just uh unsure about that right now I, um, I see. I think that's one worry you don't have to you know, worry about you know, whether if the game ends up being fun or not. Of course, you got to wait. But the idea of you know the focus not being on the single player and the actual campaign, I think that's yeah. all it is because that's I'm pretty sure there is no multiplayer for this game. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. It looks really fun, like you said, all the force powers and stuff. But I don't know. I I just have this. This little seed of doubt in the back of my head. <laughs> well, I, I guess mean, I can no, understand that because I haven't played Anthem, but I know you've had and told the stories <laughs> yeah. of the issues with that game. Yeah. So, yeah, a little, a little, uh, 
a little shaky on that one. Well, hopefully by the time it comes out in November, I'll, I'll let you know because <laughs> if it's one you should be worth getting, and I'll delay your fears to rest. <laughs> so yeah, after that was you know Xbox's press conference the following day after on last Sunday. So and I don't know this one, Microsoft didn't bl- necessarily blow me away or get me excited about an overwhelming amount of games. There's really only a couple of that I that stood out to me and it wasn't really any of the big ones that a lot of people were talking about. So I don't know. Was there anything from the Microsoft press conference that stood out to you, Dane? Re- <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, not really. Um, ever since uh, Bungie left, uh, I can't really get excited about Halo, you know. So, hey, there has been some great Halo games since they left, though. Halo Four, oh, really? Was really good, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, not really. Um, what's your What's your take on the Cyberpunk game? Because that's the one everyone's talking mm-hmm. about. Was one of the big games shown there, and you know, Keanu Reeves came out on stage, and everyone got excited. <laughs> it's cool that he's in the game, but yeah, oh, that game just it hasn't grabbed me. It just doesn't look very appealing to me. I, it's being hyped up as one of the bigger games coming out, but right now I'm just not super excited about it. So I played The Witcher Three. Mm-hmm. That's one of the best games, the RPGs I've played. Yeah, I've heard great things right? about it. Um, and it is coming to Switch. Yeah, <laughs> <If you're watching. laughs> so you can play it again, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the, the pro- I I know everybody's excited about uh, Keanu, um, being I- involved with Cyberpunk. Only problem is, is again, I got to bring up Anthem. <laughs> uh, they, it, it's kind of the same story where they had one game and then they restarted it. So Cyberpunk is that same. It, 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 oh, really? It's See, the I didn't same even know that. exact story. So it depends when it's coming out. If it's coming out next year, he might want to hold off and wait for the reviews. If it's coming out the following following year, <laughs> then yeah, it might be a a, a great game, a good game. You see, th- that one has me shaky also <laughs> because it has that like I I think I read somewhere that they they I'm not sure if it was a full restart or if they just changed direction with what they had. Uh-huh. So. I'm not sure about cyberpunk. I know everybody's excited about um, Keanu and stuff, but you might want to be careful with that one. Is it a multiplayer aspect to that game as well? Do you know? Because like I said, I've only seen time I've seen the games when they showed it at E3 (laughs) and these press conferences. I haven't really dived into looking up what the game's actually going to feature. Yeah, you see, I had the impression that it was uh, The Witcher, Three, which is an uh-huh. open world RPG in a sci fi world. Okay. You know? So, or in a cyberpunk world. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is part of the change direction. Mm-hmm. You know? So, yeah, not really sure about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, as far as the other stuff in the Microsoft press conference goes, um, see, some of the stuff that grabbed my attention that got me excited was stuff that they oh, didn't feature Tim, too much. Tim, sorry. Um, it was originally supposed to be multiplayer, but they have since uh, prioritized the single player. Mm, see, well, that's yeah. good to hear. But see, now I wonder if prioritize means fully get rid of, or just it's still going to be there, but just not something they're going to give too much, I guess attention to when developing it so yeah because if that's the case that means it might be a lackluster multiplayer and just get rid of it altogether but (laughs) yeah so i mean uh cd project red has a great reputation especially after the the witcher 3 and all of the the dlc that came with that game Mm -hmm. um but i i know they changed direction and you know same thing happened with Anthem. so might want to be careful on that one. Yeah, it's supposed to come out early 2020. So yeah. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> you know, <laughs> your concerns are legit for this one too. <laughs> but 
but I mean, they, they they have been working on it for a long time, but and hopefully they you know that pays off. Yeah. Where you know this is the time where they felt it's you know where they want it to be. They had enough time to do it, and now it's officially done, and not a release date they're just trying to hit. So yeah, right, right. <laughs> that's the hope. <laughs> but yeah, so like I was saying, some of the other games that were shown that I'm excited about, but it was just kind of shown in brief trailer formats was uh, the sequel to Ori and the Blind Forest, which was that Xbox One exclusive indie game that came out a couple of years ago. And the sequel, The Wills and the Wisps, it just looks fantastic. I don't know if you heard of that game, Dane. I think I mentioned to you on our last E3 <laughs> discussion last year because that was the announcement trailer for it. Yeah. And I've been waiting for when it was supposed to come out. And now we finally got a date, and that's February 2020. So another 2020 game. But man, it's looking gorgeous. The art style and it's just so good. It's just like a fantasy storybook brought to life and I just love it. And it's it's a Metroid style type or you know those the terms like when you combine Metroid and Castlevania, Metroidvania I think's the term <laughs> or something like that or that style of gameplay where those big map where you backtrack and go to the places to get items and all that stuff, but it's really really fun. So I'm excited for that one. Glad it has a release date. Then we got a new they showed a Finally got a little more information on that Dragon Ball Z RPG game that was announced a while ago and now titled Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. It looks great. The graphics on it looks, you know, so close to the anime almost. <laughs> it does it's a really good job. But um, the one thing that's not that have me super excited about Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, like I was for Dragon Ball Fighters, is that they're redoing the same old story that we've seen and played millions of times of the main Dragon Ball saga, which, you know... Stories how Dragon Ball Z begins with the Saiyan saga, Raditz, Vegeta, Nappa, leave it up to the Frieza saga. So nothing new there, but I'm hoping there's enough RPG and gameplay elements that would make it fun to re-experience that. And there has been some demos that shows the open world and some of the stuff you can do as Goku and exploring that environment, which looks pretty fun. So um, keep my eye on that one because, you know, me being a huge Dragon Ball Z fan, I'm going to check it out. But just kind of wish there was a little something more new to the story aspect of it and since both in game tons of games that explored the dragon ball z story tons of times so i am a little surprised at just going back to that well and then i guess the last thing of course they showed at the conference was halo infinite the new trailer for that um which you know they didn't show pretty much any gameplay of it but just more showing the story aspect of this you know pilot or who was you know stranded out in space and mass runs into master chief and master chief tells him you know time still got a fight <laughs> that, that, that's coming on but and showing more of the environment um but it looks good but here's one disappointment that i have and one disappointment i have in general with the microsoft press conference this is going to be me being the old man gamer but they're already talking about the next console that they're going to have and halo infinite is going to launch with it you know which is cool and i liked how phil spencer the head of microsoft or xbox said how you know the first xbox launched with a halo and now we're going to continue that again for the first time with our new system launching with a brand new halo game which is cool but at the same time i'm not ready for a new console yet dane <laughs> though about you because really <laughs> we've had this you know technically the time frame it is about that time even maybe past time for a new console generation to kick off because xbox one came out in 2013 and it's going to be 2020 when the next one hits. So that's seven years. That's you know a pretty good console life cycle. But here's the thing with this one. Just two years ago, they came out with the Xbox One X. Or not even two years. It's going to be two years later this year. But the Xbox One X came out, which was, you know, like the PS4 Pro, those you know, in-between upgrades to the systems that I wish would have held off and stayed off the next console generation a little bit longer than it has. Because I just got those two systems and they're barely going to be two years old and the next systems are going to be out. So it's like I'm just getting into the 4K realm. I just got my 4K TV a year and a half ago with the Xbox One X. And now when I heard at the Microsoft press conference how this new system, of course, they're building up to be the most powerful thing ever. It's going to be 8K compatible. I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> it is, not everyone's even adapted to 4K yet. Now 8K stuff, I'm seen tv advertisements for it now the system's gonna have it so it's like i'm just not ready to make that jump into the next upgrade already when the 4k boom's just getting started so it's like i don't know knowing that halo is coming out and gonna launch with the new system see i don't know if i'm gonna part of me wants to say yeah i'll 
just get the next system right when it launches. But will I have a TV that's going to be able to be compatible with all its new features like 8K and all that stuff? Are those going to be more affordable? So I don't even know if I'm going to be able to experience the full capabilities of the system if I get it at launch. And then knowing that if I just wait and get Halo Infinite on the Xbox One X, knowing that there's a better version out there, <laughs> this, you know, always irks me that I'm not playing that better version. So kind of a mixed reaction to that. But, you know, the next console generation's coming. So um, it's either going to be adapt or just wait and <laughs> try not to complain too much about it. But it's coming. It's just a matter of if we're going to be taking advantage of all the new capabilities that our consoles are going to have. But just hearing all that stuff about 8K and you know, just made me think, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. I'm just still getting, you know, Adap- not adapted, but still getting used to having the 4K, which was not too long ago. So, a little bit of a mix of um, emotions for me about uh, the next phase of the Xbox console coming. Well, um, I don't know if you remember, Tim, but I bought my PS4 day one, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and there wasn't that many games for it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I- so, it, 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 it was kind of like, oh, I don't know if I should. I, this was a good idea or whatever. Um, so, with that being said, I think it's okay if you wait for uh, to to buy the new Xbox, the new consoles. Mm. That's kind of where games. I'm leaning towards right now. Yeah, wait for games to come out for it before you buy it, or at least something that interests you. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, ha- having it launch the new Halo games is a pretty big deal. So really? I just got you? my interest there. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if Halo is worth the um, buying the new Xbox. I'm just hoping. I mean, it, it's it's a big noticeable jump that when you compare visuals for the Xbox One version and their new system, you can tell a drastic change. Because sometimes, like in the last console phase, it was almost hard to tell a big gap between games that look better on the newer system. So it's just hope it's a substantial enough you know improvement that you're able to tell oh man i gotta play on the new system because it looks so much better yeah which makes me kind of like i don't know it makes me wonder um especially with naughty dog even though they weren't at e3 um you know they released the last of us Mm -hmm. um on ps3 it was the end of the life cycle of ps3 so i'm just wondering like and, and Last of Us 2 comes out later this year. So I'm just wondering, like, how come they just don't wait for the new console? I know. It's part yeah, of that thing right. where I think they don't want to leave anyone out. Like, right, who's not going right. to adapt to the next console right away. So, And plus, too, you can re-release it and make more money. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> like, updated graphics or whatever. Mm. Yeah. That's the way it goes now. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was Microsoft's press conference. Like I said, just a few games there that caught my interest and got me excited. And then after that, I guess, was Nintendo's where they didn't have a press conference, but like they do every year, they have their Nintendo Direct. That's a video just showcasing the stuff they have planned coming out. And I always like when they have their videos. I mean, I think it's a cool way to do it. To have to sit through too much monologuing and crowd reaction to just see the content. Oh, that's cool. But um, I will say Nintendo, even though not going to get every game that was shown on there, I liked how their press conference or their Nintendo Direct had a lot of variety of games. Like I haven't seen on a Nintendo console in so long. You got these, you know, mature games like you mentioned, The Witcher's coming out. They're getting, uh, you know, more Resident Evil's games on there. Just a lot more content that you haven't seen on the Switch in a long time or a Nintendo console in a while mixed in with their classic franchises and other games so they just had a great variety of content on there for a lot of different game styles for gamers to play so that was cool to see but the ones that stood out to me first off the smash brothers character dlc that's always a big deal when we get new roster announcements and they had two of them here uh let's start off with uh the new dragon quest characters i'm not a huge dragon quest fan or i haven't only played one of them which was dragon quest 8 but um it's cool that that franchise is getting recognized in smash brothers but then the big one that had everybody freaking out <laughs> was excited. Banjo Kazooie is back on a Nintendo system. They're going to be in Smash Brothers. <laughs> Did you ever play those games on the 64? No. 
No, I haven't. I played a little bit of the first one. You know, of course, they're made by Rare and Microsoft owns Rare now. But those games I considered classics on the 64. It was fun from when I played it. Just never got around to finishing it. It's your typical platformer, but you know, it was good, for, really great for back in its day as far as visuals and platforming goes. But I know it has a huge fan base, and there's Nintendo fans who wish they were still part of the Nintendo family. So <laughs> the fact that uh, Nintendo and Microsoft got together to make this work was really cool. So just more characters to add to the roster of Smash Brothers, which is always great. And then other games that were shown there, um, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. There wasn't, you know, a lot of comic based comic book based video game stuff coming out of E3 like they have before, especially on the DC front. <laughs> Nothing as far as, you know, new Batman stuff. And again, no news from Rocksteady's new project, which is seemed to be the tradition now at every E3. <laughs> Asking what is Rocksteady gonna be there? And then it's always a no, unfortunately. So gotta hope for next year. But Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 is one it was announced at the video game awards back in December. So there was a surprise that it's going to be a launch or an exclusive for the Switch and not the other systems. And I love the first two, or I should say the first Marvel Ultimate Alliance. I've never finished the second one, but that first game was so good. Such a you know love letter to the Marvel Universe with so many characters to play as and a lot of Easter eggs. So I'm glad it's making a comeback. But seeing more of it here, it looks really good. And I'm actually more excited about it. The character roster is so big. Even the menus like kind of more like a Smash Brothers character selection <laughs> screen, but the roster is covering so many aspects of the Marvel universe, which is great. Not leaving any out, you know, like you know Marvel versus Capcom Infinite did, where it left out, you know, the X Men and any characters owned by Fox because they felt only fans cared about ca- characters who were in the MCU, but <laughs> which was so stupid. I still haven't played that game, and I don't know if I ever will because <laughs> of that. But this game, you know, it's encompassing everything of the Marvel Universe. It looks really fun. So can't can't wait for that one. And are we talking about another Marvel game in a little bit? But <laughs> we'll get onto that a little later. But after that, and for the Nintendo one, go to Zelda Link's Awakening, the remake. I'm warming up to that graphic style, I got to say. At first, when they first announced it, I was excited it's getting remade because I love that original Game Boy game. But the art style, it just looks like, almost like you're playing with toys or a pop-up book it just looks it's very distinctive i'm not sure if i was you know really keen on it when i saw it because i was taken back about it what taken back by it when i first saw it but the more i see of it the more i'm warming up to it it's not gonna might be my favorite graphic style by any means but i'm just getting used to the I- idea of how it looks and how it's gonna fit into the zelda game which i'm just looking forward to playing again because it's a fantastic game so that's exciting it but looks the like one, the um looks like the amiibo world yeah you're right that's a good comparison <laughs> yeah like when you saw a picture of the amiibo figure of that link it looks you know indistinguishable from the gameplay <laughs> model of it <laughs> but that wasn't the big zelda news the nintendo direct ended with the cool reveal that yes a zelda breath of the wild sequel is in development and they showed off a trailer it was a short trailer but it got me pretty excited because I like how they're taking the Majora's Mask to Ocarina of Time approach, where it's a direct sequel for that game with the same link in that same universe, but they're just doing something different with it, and that looks to be the case with the Breath of the Wild sequel. Zelda and Link are together, which is making me and I know a lot of of other fans hopeful that Zelda will be playable in this game, and there'll be some gameplay mechanics where you got to use both of them to solve puzzles, which I think would be really cool. Maybe co-op. To have the first ever two-player Zelda game, that would be interesting. But uh, we'll see if that's going to be the case. Nintendo didn't say anything. But this, this new game has such a darker tone to it than Breath of the Wild did. Again, reminded me of Majora's Mask, because that felt darker than um, Ocarina of Time. So I just love that they're going in this direction. And hopefully it'll come out sooner rather than later, because they got you know the engine already made the world map already done for breath of the wild so hopefully it won't be too much of a development cycle so we can start playing this game sooner rather than later because i'm excited and itching to continuing that story from Breath of the wild and see where it goes here so just really excited about that really glad it got announced and we got a little glimpse of it with the trailer and just seeing all these creepy stuff with this you know they're in this cave or this dungeon there's this ooze coming out swallowing up a rat on a stair you got this um looks like one of the temple guardians but it's almost a different version of it. So it almost looks like it's a zombie type. 
it just you know a lot of different horror elements that looks to be in this game so uh should be exciting i can't wait to find out more about it the title and the actual gameplay mechanics but it was a great way to cap off their direct and to you know get you excited about future zelda games which is you know always a highlight of any e3 whenever we get a new zelda game announcement so should be fun are you ready to be uh surprised too oh yes let's hear it <laughs> uh that pokemon game looks really good really <laughs> yeah um in, in fact i might uh, it might be the first pokemon game i've ever played <laughs> wow this is uh and, the sword and shield or is this a different yeah one? Sword, uh, sword and shield okay yeah. Looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> that is surprising because I've yeah I, I've never played a com- complete Pokemon game. I've dabbled here and there with like the old sixty four one with Pokemon Stadium and Pokemon Snap, but yeah, any like the main hardcore RPG ones on the handheld games, I've never played. And I think this is supposed to be like that, but just on a console. Uh, excuse me. Uh, second Pokemon game I played. I played the the pokemon snap where you gotta take all the pictures yeah <laughs> on, the, on the n64 yeah i, I didn't really that. like that game <laughs> it was fun uh not uh in, in the sense of nostalgia i'm sure if it came out today i'd be like what is this <laughs> <laughs> well, i should try playing it again i think it's on the uh no yeah on the old virtual consoles was on there trying to think if they have it on there for the switch but the switch doesn't have those too many of the old games i don't think to yeah. buy on their store so especially not n64 games yeah <laughs> they should though <laughs> yeah i don't know so how are you on zelda i have, have you even finished the first breath of the wild game no i haven't <laughs> oh, dang uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's it's just a really big game and you know it's uh, it's uh irritating factor i'd say having to constantly get a new sword new weapon new shield new bow and arrow new bow uh arrows you know and then oh you know you you can't do that yet you have to level up your your glider or whatever you know <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's the, the irritating glider factor of it. <laughs> yeah well you know it's it's just the irritating factor. Like, oh, you, you can't beat that boss yet because you don't have enough hearts. You know? That's, so. the, that's the whole fun of trying to build yourself up and explore and get that get stronger so you can do it. I can understand the sword and shield breaking, but that actually gets better as you move along. You get stronger weapons, and once you get the yeah. massive sword, it kind of takes care of that. So it's got to progress a little further, Dean. <laughs> yeah, it, especially in the beginning when you, um, you can't... Um, go into cold weather that long yeah <laughs> and like I, I didn't know that you could get this shirt i forget what it's called like a cotton fleece shirt or something mm-hmm. and so like i went around the map for like three or four hours looking for um uh the, the peppers to make uh like <laughs> to hot your, food to keep yourself warm yeah <laughs> to keep myself warm to get to the thing that i wanted to get to um so yeah, it's it's just that irritating factor, <laughs> that yeah. inconvenient factor. I'd say. I will say, if there's one thing they change from the first Breath of the Wild to the sequel, is that <laughs> if they can get rid of the weapon, yeah. the breaking mechanic, that'll be fine. <laughs> just give me the master sword and the master shield, and uh, yeah, just have us level that up rather than. You know, Which you can uh, when you get it, so you just have to get it, Dan. <laughs> yeah, but doesn't it still run out of uh, energy or whatever? Yeah, that's the recharge, but it yeah. it's still worth it. <laughs> I mean, you just, when it recharges, you use one of your other weapons for a bit, and then it's recharged before you know it and good to go. Yeah, but... I, but then you can do other side quests that I think, once you do these side quests, it fully charges it where you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, and I don't know if this happened to you, but... Um, uh. You know, I'd be fighting a boss, and I'd go through all of my weapons, and the only thing I have left is a stick. Oh uh, yeah, and you gotta <laughs> you gotta fight the boss with a stick. <laughs> That's the point where you just leave and wait yeah. <laughs> to find new weapons <laughs> or a skeleton <laughs> arm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those are better than a stick, I will say. And losing my horse, like I I don't know how many horses it must have been like three or four horses that wow. I tamed. That I lost. 
Stopping. <laughs> so yeah, you can bring your horses back when you get to the horse god fairy that could resurrect your horse. Uh, but I, I didn't use my horse too much. I still, I from certain places I would use it to get to a spot, but I didn't, like I should say, I didn't use it enough to where I lost it in battle. <laughs> yeah. I do like the puzzles, though. Oh, and, they're uh, fantastic. Yeah. Which is... Uh... Go ahead. I was going to say, which I'm sure we can expect tons of more great ones in the new game. Oh, yeah. Which I hope involves, you know, like I was saying, some co-op with Zelda to help solve, which would be fun. Yeah, well, why can't you just play Zelda? Play I think you're going Zelda. to in this one. I really do. Oh, wow. Okay. Even in interviews, producer uh, Anuma was saying how, like, he's asked that question, but he's kind of, you know, beating around the bush, not trying to say yes, but <laughs> trying to wiggle his way out of it without revealing it, so... There's some hints that leads me to believe she's finally going to be playable. Yeah, that's good. Yes. So yeah, that was Nintendo's Direct. And moving on to the last big one for me anyway, which is probably the highlight of E3 for me, the Square Enix panel, which they've had a lot of content too. A lot of it was, you know, some remakes of some classic RPGs, some new stuff. But I love how their goal is to getting all the old Final Fantasies out digitally on other consoles. I, my ultimate goal is to have all the Final Fantasy games on one console. <laughs> so they're slowly but surely that's happening. And they just announced Final Fantasy VIII's coming onto Xbox, Switch, and PS4, which was kind of weird. That was omitted in some of their last announcements where they <laughs> said these games are coming onto consoles, but for some reason eight wasn't in there, but now it is, which is great. Some new Kingdom Hearts 3 DLC had a new trailer for that, which I'm excited about. And before I get to the big one for me, they had another game that everyone was really excited to see for the first time. And I alluded to this earlier when talking about Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. And this is Square Enix Avengers game, which was announced a while ago. I'm not exactly sure how long, but I think this might have been two years at the least. But we just had the announcement. No screenshots, no trailers, no nothing. But at the press conference, we finally got our first look at it. And the reactions were interesting, to say the least, <laughs> regarding this game. Um, right off the bat, I will say, you know, the thing everybody's talking about, the character models and how they look, it did stand out as being a little off and a little strange. I'm not going to lie. It did stand out to me as well before I even saw everyone else freaking out about it. There's just something about characters like Thor, Tony Stark, and Steve Rogers without their helmets on where they just don't look right. <laughs> um, it feels like they're trying to make them recognizable like the MCU, but at the same time, not. And it's a weird mix up that just doesn't feel right. Steve Rogers looks older than he should. <laughs> Someone had a funny uh, meme saying, when did uh, Joe Buck join the Avengers? <laughs> That's what Steve Rogers looks like. The sports announcer Joe Buck. Really? <laughs> like, yeah, that <laughs> cracked me up. <laughs> Black Widow doesn't like her hair doesn't look right, too. And there's this end shot of the or not the end shot but the last moment of the trailer where it's in the future tony stark has his long hair <laughs> it just looks strange <laughs> i don't know this is probably i think people are making too big of a deal of it but it's saying you know the game's horrible because of it which is a little extreme but i couldn't help but notice that yeah the character models seem a little off but as far as gameplay goes uh the graphic you know it's not coming out till a whole year so i've Pretty confident they'll be able to polish up those models and make it look better. And the trailer they shown was mainly cinematic, but we got a little shots of gameplay stuff here and there. And that does look fun. I'm going to say the graphics on that looks really good, and that has me excited for it. So um, just a little strange how the characters looked and then how it, the story they're trying to tell. It's, you know, almost it's got a lot of comparisons. Oh, they're kind of doing their own versions of like Infinity War where the Avengers lose and they have to pick up the pieces it's set five years later like endgame was so um little comparisons here and there which you know kind of made me think i well, how coincidental is that or how planned was that <laughs> that they're telling this type of avenger story and i'm sure it's no coincidence that the main playable characters so far revealed are the main avengers we see in the first movie minus hawkeye so i'm sure that wasn't a coincidence as well but um i'm still gonna be you know excited about it so Event, new Avengers game, which, you know, hopefully it's going to be its own. I like how its own unique thing. It's not adapting anything or being based off a movie. I'm just hoping it takes, you know, takes some cues and ends up being in the same vein as the Arkham games and Spider-Man PS4, because those are the 
high water marks as far as comic book based video games that did their own thing and did phenomenal jobs with it. So hopefully that'll be the case with uh, the Avengers. But right now it didn't blow me away like the trailers for, you know, any of the Arkham games and Spider-Man PS4 did. So it has a little bit of a hill to climb, but I think it'll get there. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that says it all. <laughs> didn't really impress me. Mm, and I, I can understand it, yeah. Yeah. Did you feel the same way about those character models looking a bit off to you? <laughs> no, not really. Really? Uh, but maybe I'm, I'm, I'm just not uh, the... Marvel fanboy. Mm. But nothing oh. else in there that just made you go, oh, I can't wait to play it. <laughs> like, No, anyway. not really. Uh, it looks it looks like it doesn't have really anything special about it besides the fact that you're playing the Avengers. Yeah, that's you totally know? fair. So, I would agree with that. Yeah. It just looks like any game that you can put together, but this one has the Avengers in it. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, like I said, there's a whole year before it comes out. So, hopefully, once they yeah. start revealing more and showing more, we'll get more get us more excited about it. But, um, have you played uh, Dragon Quest Eleven? No, the only Dragon Quest mm-hmm. game I played was Number Eight on the PS2. You know, because I've been, I've been sort of wanting a good RPG, right? I've just been wanting to play a good RPG. Heard good things about uh, it, though. Yeah, and I don't know if that's it or not. Um, it's definitely, um, yep. or my favorite game of E3 is definitely going to be an RPG, mm-hmm. um, one that I didn't expect would happen. Interesting. That I've I've played I played a long, long time ago. Um, but yeah, uh, I've just been looking for a good RPG, and I don't know. I, you see, that's the thing with you know. Uh, the the JRPGs, the Japanese RPGs, right? It's like, is it going to be one of those things where it's only for a specific audience? Yeah, that is it's only going to be true. like, yeah, this complicated thing, or is it going to be more like Witcher Three, where it's made for everyone? You know, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I will say if you're looking for an RPG, well, I haven't played it yet, but I want to. I want to get it eventually. It's on the Switch. It's called Octopath Traveler. I played the demo yeah. of it. It's it's like old school, you know, Super Nintendo style RPG, which I love. So if you're into that style, that might be one to check out. Yeah, I've uh, the last RPG I played was uh, Divinity Original Sin Two. Okay, which is really good. Um, it's it's that classic top down, yeah, Bioware RPG. And another cool thing about Dragon Quest XI, the definitive edition that's coming out on the Switch that I think is cool, you can actually play it in old school 16-bit graphic style. Really? <laughs> you can have the choice, yeah. Which, if I were to play it, I might just play it that way because I just love that style. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the old man gamer in me coming out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, of course, the big one at Square is Enix's panel and my game of E3. Oh, Tim, can, can, can I interrupt you really quick? Go ahead before I, um, I start rambling. <laughs> yeah, before, before you go on for three hours about <laughs> what uh, what is uh, going to be your favorite pick. Um, so I was looking for this trailer, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I typed in Final Fantasy trailer. I actually clicked on the online one. Okay, 14. I was like, okay, where's Cloud? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, they should get rid of the on- online ones from the numbered ones. Oh, man. Nothing but irks me more in the Final Fantasy main franchise than that. Yeah. <laughs> I it, really hate that 11 and 14 are online ones. Because yeah. they they're don't they not true Final Fantasy entry games that should be numbered. It's, they should just be called Final Fantasy Online number <laughs> one and then number two. <laughs> so don't put those numbered entries of the main series in there that bugs me to no end because i don't count those as main final fantasy games yeah i was it final fantasy 13 that just came out no 15 oh 15 sorry um final fantasy 15 i I bought it right and then uh one of the dlcs came out or something and i was like oh you know what i'll buy it i'll get it 
I bu- I bought the Final Fantasy fourteen DLC. <laughs> <laughs> Are you not good with Roman numerals, Dane? <laughs> yeah, I j- just wasn't paying attention. So uh, I I own I don't know one of the Final Fantasy fourteen online expansions or whatever you call it DLCs. <laughs> Even though I don't own the base game. Well, okay. <laughs> That's funny. So it should let you know, like, hey, we don't detect that Final Fantasy XIV's installed right. on your system. Like, you sure you want to buy this thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that happened, but yeah, I, I'm the brand new owner. Or <laughs> not, brand, not brand new, but I am the owner of one of the Final Fantasy XIV online expansions <laughs> uh, <dang. laughs> but sorry I, I i interrupted you tim so i will say the you... final fantasy 14 its art style and like the medieval setting looks really cool i mean I, I wish that was a main numbered entry without the online multiplayer stuff because i love the character designs the art style that medieval setting the knights the armors they have it looks really cool but i'm never gonna play an mmo again i just never last with those so yeah Unfortunately, I won't experience that world. Yeah, same story with me. Um, just can't get into it. Don't have that time commitment that mm-hmm. you need for that. Yep. Um, but yeah, I own the expansion. So <laughs> at least you could say that. <laughs> at least I could say that. <laughs> Which is something you can't say, Tim, because you don't own. See, see you, you see, you, you don't have the complete collection like I do, Tim. <laughs> Ooh, you know what? You're right. See, yeah. which is why it bugs me that those games are numbered <laughs> yeah. no. i can't say i have every numbered final fantasy game because i have nothing yeah. of 14 yeah. so you got one up on me dane yeah. <laughs> as far as final fantasy goes <laughs> but sorry i interrupted you in what is probably going to be your game of the year the century <laughs> well i don't know about that but yeah it's probably getting an early preview of our game of the year talk of 2020 (laughs) final fantasy 7 remake first off we got a release date which i will say i'm not confident it's going to hit that date this is square enix and you know they are with release dates they announce one then you got to wait for two more delays (laughs) before you get the real release date so but for right now final fantasy 7 remake is coming out march 2020 which i'm hoping it sticks to that because man i cannot wait for this it blew me away when they showed this extended trailer and then some gameplay demos of it and of course this was announced back at e3 2015 so (laughs) by the time it comes out it'll be five years and we've got little sneak peeks here and there but this was finally like a full-blown look at what the game's going to be like and man (laughs) it's so good final fantasy 7 is my second favorite video game of all time it's my favorite final fantasy just love the gameplay aspect love the characters cloud is awesome the side characters are amazing in this game tifa is awesome red 13 sephiroth as a villain there's so much great stuff i just love the world the soundtrack everything about final fantasy 7 and the way that we're going to be experiencing this amazing story with these great characters looking like it does in this remake it's just man i'm just at a loss for words for how amazing it looks if you were to ask me you know 22 years ago when the game first came out and i played it thinking that i would be able to experience this with the graphics we have today looking like this, I would never believe you. <laughs> it just looks amazing. Like anything I was hoping to remake would. It just looks fantastic. The, the character models and the environments are just draw droppingly gorgeous. <laughs> I just blown away every time I see it. But you know, graphics don't make everything. And while that's enough to get me plenty excited, even more so actually seeing the game in action, its gameplay mechanics looks so much fun. I mean I was going to be happy with it just being a remake of the standard RPG turn-based style we got in the original game, you know, just was updating the graphics, but they're keeping the mechanics the same. I would have been good with that. And part of me kind of still wishes that would be the case because I would love to just replay the whole game like that with the graphics of today. But what they're doing with this gameplay mechanics now just has me excited because it's kind of the best of both worlds where it is going to turn into an action RPG, but yet still has that turn-based element to it as well. Because when they showed off in the trailer in the demo, you see Cloud and Barrett in the bombing mission on Midgar, um, the very first mission you play in the game, and you're seeing it more as an action-style game. Cloud is slashing with a sword, and you can switch between Cloud and Barrett with Barrett and his arm gun. 
and you can switch between them, which looks fun. But here's the thing that was new and I wasn't expecting that gets me real excited where it still has an active time bar that fills up like it would a normal RPG after time. It just fills up and then you get to take your turn and issue your command. But with this, the one you attack an enemy with your a sword, that builds up your active time bar meter. And once it fills up, then it kind of turns you or you have the option, I should say, which is important. You have the option to turn it into, you know, that classic RPG style where it slows down a bit and then you get that menu, what attack you want to use, you know, magic, item, abilities, and you get to use it on your opponents like you would any, like the old original game. And that, the one it was displayed in the demo, it looked to work really well where you're in the middle of action, you could stop, issue your commands, and it felt like the original Final Fantasy VII. So I just love the blend that it's having with it because the action element of it could be fun if it's more like Final Fantasy XV or the Kingdom Hearts style swordplay, but then it's still with that classic turn-based RPG gameplay mechanics that I love as an old school fan mixed all into one looks so much fun. When I saw that, I was like, oh man, this is going to be a blast to play and I just cannot wait. And then they showed the first boss battle you have with that scorpion uh, robotic boss, which, you know, is so much different from that original game, but <laughs> it just looks like a blast to play and with the action you're going to be going through and have to take it down between Cloud and Barrett. It just looks so much fun and I just can't wait. And that was just the first bit. And they showed a trailer. at a, They had a special Final Fantasy VII musical concert, which I wish I would have went to. That would have been awesome. But that's where they debuted a new trailer and the release date. But at Square Enix's panel at E3, they showed that trailer, but it was expanded with a lot more details. We got our first look at Tifa and uh, more aspects of the se- sequences in Midgard we're going to get, which is the first, uh, or I should say, which Final Fantasy VII, its first half takes place in. and. That looks amazing. Seeing the battles with Cloud, Aerith, and Tifa as a in your group party looks awesome. All that new footage just looks so good. Again, seeing these classic characters looking like we've never seen them before. It was just amazing to see and knowing that we're going to play them looking that great in detail. Well, I just cannot wait. And another cool thing about it is how they're going to be expanding a lot more story-wise on the game. Because this is kind of a bit of a mixed reaction from fans because Final Fantasy VII Remake is not going to be the full remake of Final Fantasy VII. It's actually going to be split into several games because this first one is all going to take place on Midgard, the first half of Final Fantasy VII, pretty much the first disc <laughs> on the original PlayStation. This is going to be this whole game. But it's Square Enix keeps saying it's going to feel like a whole game. You know, they're not going to shortchange you. Because they actually say it's going to be two Blu-ray discs, which you know holds a lot of information. So you know it's going to be expansive. And they said they're going to expand on a lot of story elements, adding new things here and there that weren't in the original game, new gameplay um, levels and stuff. So that has me very excited. And they showed a little bit of that where Cloud runs into Sephiroth, which might just be, you know, a dream or a vision or a memory he's having. But he runs into Sephiroth on Midgard, which is a sequence we didn't see before in the original Final Fantasy game. So all that stuff has me super excited about it. This Everything I hear about it, everything I see of it, the gameplay mechanics, it just looks like everything I would hope for a full-blown remake of one of my favorite games of all time. I cannot be more excited about it. The only one negative I would have, and it's not even that big of a deal because this voice cast sounds great, but there are they did get new voice actors for the main characters. I really did like the voice actor for Cloud who voiced them in Kingdom Hearts, Final Fantasy VII, Advent Children, and any other Final Fantasy VII content that had voice acting with cloud i believe the actor was steve barton or steve burton gotta look up his last name but he did a great job for voicing cloud all these years i wish he would have got the chance to voice him again for his full-blown main story <laughs> for final fantasy 7 but uh, the new actors sound good in this game too and another fun fact about it uh george newborn who voiced superman and justice league he voiced sephiroth and all the previous entries like final fantasy advent children and now uh, Tyler Hoshin, who plays Superman in Supergirl and the CW universe, he's voicing Sephiroth in this game. So <laughs> Superman keeps on voicing Sephiroth, which is awesome. But uh, so, yeah, everything about Final Fantasy VII Remake looks amazing. I cannot wait to play it, see more of it. And yeah, it's just more than likely going to be my ultimate game of 2020. Unless I'm hoping Breath of the Wild sequel doesn't come around, come out the same time <laughs> around Final Fantasy VII Remake because... That will be tough not to play 
Uh, Because I think Final Fantasy VII is going to be like like top priority game once that comes out. It's just blowing me away, and I would hate to not be able to play a new Zelda game (laughs) around the same time as well. So hopefully those two games have a nice distance between each other so I can enjoy both to their fullest uh, capabilities. So yeah, Final Fantasy VII was everything for the C3, (laughs) in my opinion. It just blew me away, and I just cannot wait to experience more of it. It looks phenomenal. Well, sorry, I, I expected you to go on for at least <laughs> six more hours, Tim. I was about to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Well, like I said, I still got that cop that's lingering, so I got to <laughs> not go on too much. <laughs> it, it it looks like they took the CGI or graphics or whatever from Advent Children and just used that as the base of what they're doing now. It almost looks better than Advent Children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks yeah, better. Great. It looks better. Like they added stuff to it. Um, but yeah, like you, I'm excited. Uh, Final Fantasy VII was the first game I ever beat uh, back in 1999, mm. 98. <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited about it too. Yeah, it's oh, it's gonna be so good. I just also hope too that the rest of the Full remake doesn't take forever to come out. <laughs> like, it doesn't take another five years to get the second part, and however many parts they're going to be. Because Square Enix even said right now they don't even know how many games are going to be to complete it, but they know they just can't stop midway and not complete the whole story. I mean, yeah. that would be a major bummer and disappointment. So they got to continue this going pretty quickly, I hope. Watch it takes like 20 years. Oh, it'll be the 40th <laughs> anniversary by the time the last one comes out. <laughs> you might as well go 30 maybe the yeah. 50th, year. <laughs> 50th anniversary um uh for me I, I mean i guess i'll just go through uh you know just a couple of the games that or you know one or two games that caught my attention which was um uh for, first up it's the the wolfenstein uh game it comes okay. out later this month uh, Young Blood. Um, if you haven't played the new Wolfenstein games, they are really good. Um, the New Order was like a total relaunch of the title. Uh, great storytelling, um, especially for a first-person shooter. That was only meant to be, you know, just a first-person shooter. Uh-huh. Um, and they topped themselves with, I mean, of course the the. They had an expansion called uh, The Old Blood, but they taught themselves with the second one they did, which was uh, The New Colossus. Uh, that one really impressed me. And, um, yeah, excited to see what this, uh, or what, what they have to offer for uh, Young Blood. Um, That's cool. I never played a Wolfenstein game. I played one, like a few matches when the first Xbox came out, like back in 2002 or three, there was a game that came out on there. I played a few online matches of that, and that was about it. But like like I said, I know that recently the game's been regarded as being really good now. Yeah, yeah, especially since they fo- they're focusing on the single-player aspect of it. Uh, see, that's the key. Uh, yeah, <laughs> great storytelling, like I said. Um, le- like you, I-, I didn't really play a Wolfenstein game until... Uh, the new order came out, uh, but yeah, I love the I I love those two games. Um, uh, yeah, like I said, the the Pokemon game, um, but I have to say the surprising the 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 most surprising announcement for me, uh, the the one that I didn't see coming, and I mentioned their game before which was divinity original sin 2 i mentioned that game before um it's a top-down rpg it's one of the best i've played in a (laughs) while um i still haven't finished it it's it's like a 90 plus hour game wow um but uh they are doing Baldur's gate 3 okay finally i was (laughs) gonna say how long has it been because i know the bolt i never played the Baldur's gate series but i know you know, it's been around for a while. And I remember yeah. two being like the last one I noticed, but <laughs> right, right. So how long has it been? <laughs> uh, it's been about almost 20 years. So like that sounds 18, about right. <laughs> 17, 18 years since Bioware did uh, Baldur's Gate 2. So it's been a while. Um, but yeah, I just, 
I didn't expect this. I thought Baldur's Gate was was done uh-huh. <laughs> the video game world because I know they um uh, I can't remember who owned the assets last, but I know they were trying to sell it. Oh wow, so it was like a franchise they didn't even want anymore then for a while. Yeah, no, nobody wanted it. So um yeah, I I can't wait for it. Uh like I said, I've been waiting for a good RPG ever since. You know, I, I kind of ran off steam on Divinity Original Sin. Uh, and just what Larian Studios has been doing with, with their top-down RPGs is really impressive. And if anybody's going to do it, it ought to be Larian Studios who made the best top-down game that I've played since Baldur's Gate 2. So... Yeah, I did. there's not a lot of details besides the fact that it's only going to be on uh, computer or uh, Windows and oh wow, uh, the new Google. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> Stadia, like, is this Stadia? Yeah, I keep forgetting yeah. they announced that when they were there. Like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> They're coming out with their own console or streaming system type thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna have to bust out the old, <laughs> the old Windows computer yeah. to play it, <laughs> play it but i will do it Hope, and I, hopefully uh, it'll be a game you can finish on like arkham origin on the pc <laughs> yeah. uh i am excited for it not a lot of details uh creepy creepy disgusting teaser trailer mm-hmm. <laughs> um but yeah uh no gameplay nothing uh from the you know from that aspect but uh, you don't really have to do much. Just make it a top down. So, yeah, that's my game of E3. That's cool. Well, a couple of classic RPG series uh, make up our most excited games coming up. <laughs> and what we're showing up this year is E3. Yeah, us old men, Tim. Yep. <laughs> old men gamers, that's us now. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> with their, you know... Uh, Cyberpunks. Cyberpunks. And what are the... <laughs> Free for all games everyone's playing now. Uh, Fortnite. Fortnite, yeah. <laughs> That's not, like a, those games interest me. Like they don't interest me at all. <laughs> like, yeah. That's kind of how I know I'm so out of touch of what's popular in gaming now is like those type of games like Fortnite is like I have no interest at all to play them and that's all the rage nowadays. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I'll just continue being a grumpy old man gamer. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 waiting and waiting and waiting for games to be released. Yeah, remakes in that, in of that games. Classes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not new games, remakes of old games. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess that's it for um, our E3 uh, talk. Hey, okay? yep. Until next year. Until next year, or until Sony decides to announce stuff. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> until uh, the conference or event they have. Right. Um. So now we can move on to our news and discussion, right? Yep. Um, Not a whole lot. <laughs> but a big one for you, Tim. Oh, yes. <laughs> is that uh, the Phantasm is coming to the main DC Comics continuity. Yes, she is. And I got to <laughs> say, this immediately made me a lot more excited for the upcoming Batman and Cat- Catwoman comic series coming in 2020. <laughs> we talked about that on our last episode. And, you know, I was... You know, going to be curious to see where that story goes, depending on how t- Tom King ends his Batman run. But now with this announcement, it's like I immediately got to read it right away. So <laughs> it's to see how they incorporate one of the greatest villains in the Batman, the animated series continuity and with the Phantasm now being brought for the first time in the DC main continuity. And I can't wait because, you know, the Phantasm I can't say this is the first time the Phantasm has appeared in a comic she has appeared in other ones like uh, the Batman Beyond stories of that by Kyle Higgins, which were fantastic, and even some of the Batman Adventures comics based on the animated series. So, but first time in the main DC Comics line. So, I, I have a feeling it's not going to be you know the story we're familiar with with Andrea Beaumont. I, I hope it's still Andrea Beaumont behind the mask, but I'm sure her connection with Bruce and their history is going to be a whole lot different than what we've seen in the Phantasm. So that's what has me excited about it, too. And I'm not going to hold it against them if they change anything, because I'm expecting them to change stuff. This is a whole new continuity, whole different type of Batman history. So it makes sense for them to change it. And hopefully it'll be one that fits well with this version of Batman 
and just hopefully becomes a mainstay in Batman's Comics Rose Gallery because I think she'd be a great addition to it, just like Harley Quinn has been over the years and some of the other characters that were created in the animated series. So I'm excited about that. Like I said, it makes me a lot more anxious to read the Batman and Catwoman comic when it comes out in 2020. So this was definitely some cool news, and it was just shared on Twitter by Tom King. Just such a really cool image of the classic no, that's another thing. I'm glad it's her classic look. It looks exactly like how she does in the Phantasm. And the image they tease is with her holding up her gauntlet with her claw. And you're seeing the reflection uh, Batman and Catwoman. So really cool image. And I just you know can't wait to see what the story is going to contain. So yeah, count me as excited for it. How come Phantasm was in uh, any of the Arkham games? That I know that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Might be a little too late now, but <laughs> that would have been really, really cool. Um, our next piece of news is that there has been, or the, there's a new Wonder Woman 1984, a very colorful, yeah. very, very colorful, bordering on neon yeah. <laughs> poster of, uh, yeah, the, the, the movie, the movie poster. Um I love this new suit, Tim. I don't, yeah. I don't know how you feel about it, but man, that looks good. Well, nothing to top the classic Wonder Woman costume, I will say that. But yeah. I think it is really cool they're going with her golden armor because it is something she has worn in the comics and other stuff. Even like in Injustice, the first game, it was what part of her main outfit that she had. I'm hoping, too, she has that helmet, like that cool eagle-looking helmet. That would be cool as if she sports that in the movie too. But I'm glad they're kind of going this route because we know she's going to have her classic outfit in this movie. So the fact that she gets this one too, I think is awesome. But yeah, that poster, man, <laughs> it really stands out to you. When I first saw it, like, whoa, <laughs> those, like, <laughs> like those 3D art pictures too, where you're seeing that there's a hidden image in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it is really cool. And again, fitting with that, I guess, over the top 80s theme that they're going with for the movie. So a cool debut for her new costume that she's going to have in the movie with this really colorful background drop of all yeah. these rainbows of colors. So it was it's, an interesting uh, poster, but one that I think that works really well. It's break your screen bright. Yeah. <laughs> you can't handle the brightness. <laughs> but um, you know how this uh, Wonder Woman movie is going to be set in the 1980s? Um, you remember, I can't remember if it was the New 52 or whatever, or it might have been before, before the New 52, where they um, changed Wonder Woman's look. Yeah, with the where jacket. She, yeah, she had the jeans, she mm-hmm. had the, the jean jacket, and the looked like a tube top. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, since it's set in the 1980s, I think they, uh, she should wear a jean jacket. <laughs> maybe she will at one point yeah maybe it'll be like a little nod to that costume but it'll be like one where they're making fun of it because yeah. that look nobody liked no like, it's like right before the new 52 so it didn't even last long it's right. kind of forgotten <laughs> now so <laughs> it could be like a joke type thing where she's like dressed as that like mm, this just doesn't quite work <laughs> um speaking of movies though i did see uh robert pattinson in this movie called high life I guess okay. it's his new movie. He is really good in it. Nice. And, I think I keep... uh, yeah, if if you had any question on, on him playing a serious drama role or whatever, or doing something besides Twilight, this is the complete opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the complete opposite of that. I mean, he still has... He's still a good-looking guy, but yeah, he, he's got amazing range on his acting ability <laughs> that's great to hear so, i mean i i think that's one of the movies i keep seeing people reference you know like check this out if you're concerned about robert pattinson being batman like yeah yeah that's why i checked it out <laughs> the one on amazon yeah it's where, on amazon it's on uh, where it's like he's a criminal with his brother no 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 it's a different okay. yeah this that's one the one i keep hearing uh, about too he's an astronaut oh, okay yeah yeah um it's uh, it's totally in the opposite direction of what he was doing on Twilight. <laughs> um, don't judge him by Twilight. Don't ever judge him on that. 
which should go without saying just in general, but yeah. <laughs> without any doubts, now that we got your confirmation date. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that that's great casting, I'd say, for this new Batman. Yeah, now the new thing is all these, I'm sure you've seen it, almost like every day now, this villain's going to be in the Batman. This oh, villain's yeah. going to be in the Batman. Like we got, Mad Hatter, I think it was. Yeah, that's the latest yeah. with Two-Face, which don't get me wrong, I'd love to see Mad Hatter finally be in a movie. <laughs> but. Yeah, right. It just seems a little crazy at this point where every day now some reports coming out about a new Batman villain showing up. And part I'm not discounting it, to be honest, because we've heard so many times how this new Batman movie is going to feature multiple villains. And it's kind of leading that to be the case. I just think it's funny right now that within the span of a week, there's like eight villains who were <laughs> so supportively <laughs> rumored now. You got Penguin, Catwoman, Riddler, Two-Face. Mad Hat, I think Firefly is another one. So the list kind of yeah. keeps going on and on until we get, <laughs> I think, all the Rose Gallery in there. Um, don't use Joker, but <laughs> you use someone similar to him, Professor Pig. I don't I know love, why he never comes up in Professor these. Professor Pig. Yeah. I don't. I don't know why he never comes up in these conversations. Like, I know. Or these rumors, like, do Professor Pig? He's a horrifying villain. Uh, he wears a pig mask. So he has that cool look to him or distinctive look to him. Yeah, he would really stay uh, with he, you if done right in a move, live action movie. With exactly. How he looks and how creepy he can be. He's not the Joker, but he's Joker esque, right? Mm. So, yeah, Professor Pig. I don't, I don't know why, you know, this hasn't come up in these quote unquote rumors or I haven't confirmed that Professor Pig is going to be. <laughs> The new Batman movie. So yeah, you, you start this one, Dane. You start this one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because I have confidential sources, <laughs> that Professor Pig is going to be the the new villain. Um, yeah, because all these villains, we all know they're not going to be like one big team up thing where they're all for struggling pain. for screen time. It's going to be like you know, which I wish more comic book movies would do. And there has been some cases where, you know, Batman, the movie starts off with Batman taking down one villain who has no consequence to the overall story. We just see Batman taking them down. And like if there's a cool kind of like an opening James Bond sequence that kicks off a movie in a cool way. And if there's one with Professor Pig like you're talking about. That could be awesome to establish, you know, this new Batman and this world that we're going to be introduced to. So that would be really cool. But you mentioned the Joker. You want to hear the other crazy rumor? <laughs> that this one what I'm not putting too much traction on, but it's that Macaulay Culkin is going to be playing the Joker in Matt Reeves' Batman trilogy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, yeah, that's that's quite the rumor. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, again, if it ends up being accurate, can't judge the casting till you see it. Just like we've said about Robert Pattinson, so maybe Macaulay Culkin could be a great Joker, but. If yeah. he does, he has to. They have to redo that uh, classic image from the Killing Joke, where he emerges from the chemicals and he puts his hands on his head, screaming <laughs> or laughing, just like Macaulay Culkin could do a variation of that from his Home Alone days, <laughs> so where yeah. he puts his hands on his face, screaming. <laughs> that has to be done. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think like all these rumors are a little too big. Like like you're looking at the big Batman villains, whereas you look at Batman Begins. Raish is the big bad guy. And how many people outside of the comic readership knew about Raish? Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So I think we're looking too big. Like, oh, of course, it's going to be Riddler. Of course, it's going to be uh, Joker or whoever, right? Or Two-Face or whatever, yeah. right? So I think I think we got to look at the, the, the smaller villains. The villains that you really wouldn't. Yeah think of right? that's why i'm thinking the mad hatter might be really likely yeah uh so that's why i say professor pig and because you can't really use the joker now so you got the joaquin phoenix movie and you got mm -hmm. uh, whatever jared leto's doing <laughs> if he's that, doing <laughs> if he's still doing it um so yeah professor pig he's a great joker-esque villain uh, just as long as it doesn't get too close to you know, the Joker. So 100% agree. Yep. I'd be yeah. all down for that. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's move on to our comic book reviews. Uh, for this episode, we're doing Batman number 72 and Batman TMNT three number two. That's a mouthful. 
<laughs> a lot of numbers of those titles. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Roman numerals, which I got correct, right, Tim? Yeah, you did get the number three correct, yes. <laughs> well, I think Final Fantasy has too many Roman numerals. I think they need a reset. <laughs> or they just got to use regular numbers. Well, thankfully, you're not going to have that problem with Star Wars anymore with Episode Nine being it for the Skywalker saga. So I guess that cut off at a good point for you, Dane. <laughs> yeah, just, just as long as they don't do the Kingdom Hearts thing where it's like start with <laughs> Episode 10.8R71CCB, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like computer code. <laughs> CCB Ultra Edition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, and I'm sure it'll still be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so like I said, um, or like we always say at the beginning of every single comic book review that we do, there's going to be a lot of spoilers. So if you haven't read your books yet, pause it right now, read your books, and come back to us. Um, and the rating skill for this episode is going to be uh, Roman numerals that Dane can't get right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be that. <laughs> In the Final Fantasy series. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So Batman number 72, not in Roman numerals, but just number 72 on the cover. <laughs> oh, could you imagine if, like, Detective used Roman numerals? Yeah. <laughs> Especially like... now when they're the thousands. So. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like, I don't even know what the Roman numeral is for a thousand. I mean, either it'd be like the... MWT or something. <laughs> It'd be like the Super Bowl, like how the Super Bowl, like they have to use like B and stuff. Yeah, like, <laughs> I know, but, but a thousand, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, kind of totally unrelated to anything that we've been talking about, but you know, we had the Stanley Cup finals and then we had the NBA finals. Mm. You know, I'm just wondering, like, if it comes down to a game seven or, yeah, game seven or Super Bowl is one game, right? Um, you know how they make the the championship hats and shirts that the players wear after? Yeah. What happens to the losing team's one? Yeah, like, I think they actually, No, I think they actually send them to like third world countries that need like, like clothing oh. or like people that need like help with clothing and all that stuff. Because oh. uh, last I've heard, I remember I forget who was telling us. I read somewhere someone told me a story about how uh, they came across. Uh, the New York Yankees 2001 World Series champion shirts and hats <laughs> <laughs> that were being sent off to one of those places yeah, because, right. you know, they have to make them for a game seven, like you said, but I think they yeah. get they get donated to places like that, which is cool that they don't oh, go to yeah. waste, but you know, for fans of the team who just lost, I'm sure it'll be hard to see. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering like, what happens to all of like the excess or the, the um, t-shirts and hats and I don't know socks <laughs> that that aren't going to be sold because the team lost. Yeah, right. Like it's got to suck for the losing team, like to go into their clubhouse if they see like people wheeling those away from the clubhouse yeah. or like the boxes <laughs> taking them out. <laughs> it's kind of like the '86 World Series. Uh, speaking of which, uh, so sad that Bill Buckner died. Yeah, that's, that, that uh, sucked to hear. Yeah, it's they, been a bad week for. Old Red Sox players. Remember what happened to David Ortiz? Was oh crazy. yeah, Awful, he, man. He, he got shot out, outside of a club or something. He's inside of a restaurant or a bar or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's Somebody... a video that we just see him get shot in the back. It was awful, and thankfully he's yeah. gonna Pull be through. okay and yeah. you know make a full recovery report. The same, but still, it's awful. You got to go through that. Yeah, right, right. But uh, anyway, yeah, then the, the '86 World Series where they had to wheel out the champagne and stuff because. You know, unfortunately, Bill Buckner missed the, I mean, the ball went through his legs. Man, so it was it was, it was blown before Bill Buckner made that error. Oh, yeah, like... totally, totally. <laughs> uh, it wasn't his fault that no, uh, okay. the Red Sox lost. Yeah. Um, uh, hopefully he didn't see those shirts. <laughs> it was bad pitching decisions, I'd say. Yes, and just bad um, pitching. <laughs> and bad pitching, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I was just, I don't know, I was just wondering, like, you, you know, you saw the, I think, the Stanley Cup went to seven games. Yeah, it did. Um, and uh, the NBA Finals went to six, I think. Yeah. Uh, Five or six or something. Six. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, they, they, they had to have made that ahead of time, right? To, yep, to get all do. the shirts and hats and blah, 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 whatever. 
And I was just wondering what happens to all of that other stuff <laughs> from the other team. Or, or, or even, like, if, like, a team that's not very popular, like, let's say the, I don't know, what baseball team, the Padres. If the Padres won the World Series or if the Rockies won the World Series, uh, they would make a lot, right? But there's not a lot of Rockies fans, right? Well, at least enough for them. Oh. I'm sure they have a count of who in Colorado <laughs> with our fans yeah. and stuff. I'm sure they have well, a data well, as far as those who attend and the yeah. buzz yeah, but, around the city, I guess. But let's say a lot of people don't buy the championship hats or T-shirts or socks or underwear or whatever, right? What happens to all that? Is that just discounted and sold or do they also donate that? <laughs> Well, that I'm not sure. I'm sure they try to discount it at first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, I I sidetracked us. Well, now that... you know the answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, Batman number seventy two, and this one, even when we're talking about Teenage Mutant Batman, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number three, these are both, um, you know, explanation issues. I should say, <laughs> a lot of explaining as far as stuff that's happened in in the past and what that was going to affect the future of upcoming issues in the story. So um, Batman number 72, this one, there's a monologue going out throughout the whole issue, which is in the coloring font that you make you think that's Batman, but from how it's worded, you know, it's not. And it's going over through the continuing fight of Bane and Batman in Wayne Manor. I was kind of talking about how I wasn't sure if in the last issue where Batman is actually fighting Bane because there was these shots and panels where you see Batman with Bane, but then you just see him and Alfred Bane's not there, but apparently he is really is fighting Bane here. And it's pretty much Nightfall Part 11 redo <laughs> because it's they're just fighting, having a full-blown fisticuff fight, hardcore fight in Wayne Manor again, going all out. And it's pretty much the sequel to that, which I kind of have mixed reactions on, which I'll get to in a bit, but pretty much over the course of this fight, you see this monologue recounting how Bane was the mastermind behind Everything that's happened in Tom King's run since the very first issue and since Rebirth started, all the way from Gotham Girl to I Am Suicide to I Am Bane, even stuff in the Wars of Jokers and Riddles, um, and how that affected Batman and Selina Kyle's relationship of Batman telling her that secret of the events that happened in the War of Jokes and Riddles. Just everything that's happened up until the winning, everything that's gone on in Tom King's run was because of Bane. And that's what the monologue is explaining and how Bane has gone about doing this and how he's kind of of the mastermind and a genius for doing that. And I do kind of like how it is making Bane, because we all know, even going back from Nightfall, how he is a genius strategist as far as having this great plan to take down Batman and to break him. Now he's doing it again, but even more so to really, you know, break him more so than he did in Nightfall, just really break his soul and his spirit, not just his body. And there's a panel, a big two-page spread here, which has some good monologue, from this character who is revealed at the end um, about saying how Bane's plan and how it is something, you know, smart for him to do, how instead of, you know, doing the same thing, breaking his back physically and he's doing it. And like, he, he did a little mentally too in nightfall. I will say that, but he just, instead of doing all that stuff, he did the opposite. Bane gave Batman joy. This is what this character is saying. He gave him a purpose to his life, a solution to, you know, his, you know, eternal dilemma since his parents have died, having someone to love as much as he loved his parents. And he goes, yeah, he's had the Robins and, you know, his surrogate sons. And but those are really almost like as soldiers in the war. He couldn't, you know, love them like he loved his you know, parents and his family until he got to Catwoman, who became his true love. And it even says here, you know, this is something that was so dynamic that it might help that poor boy in crime alley crying at the feet of his parents, knowing he was broken. Wondering if anything can make him whole again. And yet Catwoman was the one who made him whole. But it was because of Bane's orchestrating and how this character is giving Bane props for for doing that. Doing the opposite. Giving Batman joy, but then taking it away. And as Batman has been going down this dark path, going deeper and deeper ever since that wedding issue, Bane's plan is working. Because we're seeing Batman unhinged and just in a place we've never seen before. So, reduce Bane's plan is working. And... Over the course of this fight, Batman gets a few punches in, but Bane gets the best of him here, just like, again, in Nightfall. He just slams him against the wall, throws him against the clock of, uh, you know, at least the Batcave, 
the book bookshelves are getting torn. It's like Wayne Manor is getting wrecked. <laughs> but um, I'm surprised he did this, but he did. This is somewhere I'm a little iffy on, where he does the classic sequence of Bane breaking Batman's back and goes well with the monologue being said here, I will say. It goes, you know, I see you, Bane, what you've done, what you always do. You lift him up, and that's where we see Bane lift Batman over his head. And then he says, just enough to bring him down. And then we see him snapping his back on his knee again, which part of me is going, oh, like cool nostalgia flashbacks to Nightfall. But at the same time, like, does Bane really got to do it again? Does Batman really have to, you know, get this kind of defeat the exact same way twice <laughs> from Bane? So that's the one thing that doesn't make me totally in love with it. So the issue ends with just Batman laying on the floor, presumably <laughs> back broken again but then we see who's having this monologue explaining bane's ultimate plan going through this great orchestration to bring batman down and it goes i ask you as a friend knowing what you've done what you're doing and what you will do what you will try to do to my son i ask how may i help and it's revealed that it is the thomas wayne batman going over this monologue talking about what bane has done to batman and Man, I'm just really anxious to see why Thomas Wayne is doing this. And depending how it's resolved, I got to have to wait to see how I truly feel about it because you know how much I love the button story and that plea Thomas Wayne made to Bruce about giving up Batman to live the normal life he wants for his son because he loves him and he knows the struggles of the toll it takes of being Batman and how he doesn't want that for his son. But to see his son suffer like this and now ask Bane for, to help him do it is it kind of like the greater good for his son to stop being Batman that he's allowing him to go through all this pain or is it something else or is Thomas Wayne just, you know, allowing this to happen because he knows he'll take down Bane or it is the only way to take down Bane where Bruce cannot. So I don't know. I just hope it's not something where he's truly evil and he's going along with Bane. I doubt that's the case, but until I found out, find out exactly why I'm kind of on the fence to how I feel about Thomas Wayne, uh, being on the side of Bane and allowing this to happen to his son. So I've been a solid issue though. I like some of the points that it brought out and how it makes Bane this wonderful strategist that we know he can be and how he had this great plan that he's orchestrating. So um, just kind of have to wait and see to how it all resolves as far as the Thomas Wayne aspect goes and to see how Bruce recovers from, you know, being beaten by Bane again, being Bane, if I can say it, being beaten by Bane again, the same way he was in Nightfall. So um, I'll, I'll give it a solid three and a half out of five Roman numerals that uh, Dane can't, uh, that Dane doesn't know in Final Fantasy games. So that's uh, that's pretty much all the Final Fantasies I've played. <laughs> just three. Yeah, just uh, seven, eight, and fifteen, right? Fifteen, so, nine, ten, you play ten, nine? ten. Okay, Sorry, ten. Yeah. So just a little more then. <laughs> yeah, just a little more. But now we get to Batman Teenage, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Roman numerals number three, <laughs> issue two. Now, first I got to ask you, Dave, did you see the movie yet at all? No, I haven't. Not yet. Still got to gotta get on that. It's available to rent now. So. <laughs> oh, it is? Yeah, I just got it on uh, 4K Blu-ray last week. So it's officially out everywhere <laughs> any way you can get it. So you should be able to rent it. Okay. Oh. I'm going to look it up while you do your review of Batman TMNT 3, number 2. Yes. <laughs> did I get that right? Yes, you did. Okay. All right. So, again, another issue that has some exposition going on. <laughs> this time, it's from Raphael from the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics released in 1984. You guys heard how much I love that ending from the first issue of this story, and I just couldn't wait to see where it picks up. And this one didn't disappoint either because uh, before Raphael from the original Turtles comics starts explaining what's going on, we have a cool fight sequence between this Raph, all the four Turtles, and this version of Batman. And Raphael just kicks their butts. And I love his explanation because even Raphael is kind of the Raphael in this continuity in this comic saying like what, what what the how can he beat us so so good and the original rap is saying like don't sweat it kid i've been at this a lot longer than you have really driving home that point that he is the re- original and been doing this for so long and even batman has trouble like catching up to him and landing some blows he well, the original rap is going even though i have more experience i am surprised that the five of you like are still having this much trouble trying to take me down but whatever <laughs> so then 
after he gets them, they stop fighting, he gives a history lesson on what happens. And this is really cool because when you flip the page, you get the art style of the Eastman and Laird original comics showing the origin of the turtles, just kind of how it played out in those original comics. It's just really cool. So, you know, again, I know the story hands down by heart <laughs> so many times, so it's nothing new, but seeing it told from this perspective and have this art style from that original comics mixed in to the art style we'll get in this story, it's just really cool. It's just really neat to see and have it play out like this. So I, I just love that aspect and the editorial decision to have it be, you know, get that classic Turtle Comics feel mixed in with this new story and art that they're having. It's really well done. So after Raph gives the origin story, he tells how he got captured by uh, Krang or Anti-Monitor Krang, I should say, and how he's pretty much captured, he captured Raph and the original other three turtles in that universe. And Krang makes the explanation of how, well, first off, Raph has this device that he stole from Krang's ship that allows Batman and these turtles to see what the story he's telling and everything that's going on. So as they're seeing, he's telling the story that Krang kidnapped the original four turtles and his plan is here's another cool thing that's taken from turtles lore Krang never existed in the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics his species the Utrams did but not Krang specifically and Krang is wondering or has the hypothesis that he can never beat the turtles in any other universe and in the current comics timeline that this one is from he realizes that it's because I don't exist in this original universe. I'm not allowed to ever have victory. It's But if I could have victory in this original Turtles timeline, it can allow me in the other universe universes for me to win because anything that happens in this first original timeline, you know, it affects all the other multiverses and all the other worlds. So this is a starting point. If I can get victory here, I can, you know, win out on the other universes. So I like that aspect where everything tra travels back to that original turtle story. But Crank says his, he has bigger plans than that. He wants to merge the two universes, thus being the turtles and Batman, since he's with the Anti-Monitor, who Crank defeated. Or I, I don't know how, but Crank got control of him. And then we see that he captured the original uh, Batman. But here's my one disappointment with this issue. I was hoping since we had the original Turtles in their comic forms, we'd get the original Bill Finger, Bob Kane, Batman design, that classic Detective Comics number 27 look. But this is actually more of the Silver Age Batman where, you know, the blue cape and cowl, the yellow logo shield. So I was hoping for more of that original Batman to match the original Turtles, but that's a little nitpick I have. Um, but Batman and the Turtles are able to escape Krang's clutches and they're able to get that device. They're trying to, you know, do what they can to get to the universes that are merging to stop it. And they end up fighting a bunch of Krang's as robot soldiers, Batman and the original Turtles. Uh, but Raph is the only one who was able to get the device and make his way out as Batman and the Turtles hold off those robots. And Raph goes looking, traveling through the different multiverses to get to the merged Batman and Turtle universe that we see here in this story. And that brings us back to the Batcave where Batman... And the four turtles are kind of shocked by this news. They don't believe it quite yet, but in the back of their minds, they know it's true what this Raphael is saying. And they got to, you know, stop Krang uh, before he finds them and gets his plan into motion. And then the issue ends with Krang contacting that Joker Shredder we saw in the first issue and how he's going to give him, as he says, he's going to be the, get, this Joker Shredder is going to be the one to fulfill his plans and Krang's going to give him everything he needs to win. So. Um, the Joker Shredder is going to play a bigger role in this story coming soon. So a lot of cool stuff. Again, there's a lot of ex exposition here, but I dug it how it was told. That flashback to the original 84 comic, the explanation for Krang's plan and how it all revolves around that first Turtles universe is really, really cool. So another great solid issue to the story. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Batman number three is off to a great start. So I'm going to give this one a four out of five Roman numerals that Dane doesn't understand in Final Fantasy. Just can't wait for more. Yeah, that's more than I played. <laughs> but you can't pronounce, or you know what the four looks like in Roman numerals, right? Yes, it's an IV. There you right? go. Yes. Yeah. Not and an IV that you hook BI. up to yourself, but <laughs> yeah. the letter I is a V. <laughs> four is IV, five is V, six is VI. Yes. Yeah, I got it. So you <laughs> I got can do it. your Roman numeral thing. <laughs> Just when you get into the three, the three letters, I guess. 
<laughs> anything like beyond two, yeah. <laughs> XVI is fi- 16, right? XV mm-hmm. yes. is 15. XIV is 14. And hence the Final Fantasy DLC you got. <laughs> DLC. Uh, yeah, I got it, Tim. I got it. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> so, so when Final Fantasy VII Remake comes out, I won't, uh, I won't buy the new Final Fantasy XIV DLC. Yeah. <laughs> or worse yet, the Final Fantasy XI online DLC that I don't think <laughs> even exists anymore. <laughs> but yeah, somehow you download. Hey, do they even do that anymore? <laughs> no, I think that's officially shut down. <laughs> well, they're all focused on the fourteen then. Yes. But it would be quite something if you still end up buying it somehow. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, that's the end of our show. Uh, go to the BatmanUniverse.net, Facebook.com slash BatmanUniverse, Twitter handles at BatmanUniverse, Tim's Twitter handles at TimG311, and my Twitter handles at DanesAsBanana. Uh, rate and review us on iTunes, and you can email the show at BatfansWithoutPants at gmail.com. Oh, and the show's Twitter handles at BatfansPodcast. <laughs> Sorry about that. Forgot about it. Um, so with that, like we say at the end of every single episode, Tim. We love each and every one of you with all of our bats and Roman numeral hearts. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Final Fantasy Hearts. <laughs> I think I've said that one before. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, see you guys next time. See you next time, everybody. Yeah.